Hey, beautiful people. This is Alexis Fernandez, the host of the podcast, Do You Fucking Mind? A podcast that teaches mindset hacks backed by neuroscience. This podcast gives you the tools you need to set boundaries, not take shit from anyone, to increase self-love, confidence, and even move on from an ex. I'm also going to teach you how to rewrite hardwired negative self-beliefs. And if you like going deeper into science, I even delve into what effects drugs and neurotransmitters have on your brain. So if you're okay with getting a little bit of tough love and the occasional swear word peppered in there, then this podcast is for you. Join me at the Do You Fucking Mind podcast, mindset hacks for a badass life. Hey everyone, today I'm lucky enough to have two wonderful co-hosts. The talented and brilliant actor Meredith Salinger and her husband, legendary actor and comedian Patton Oswalt. We talk all about their relationship and how they met, then Patton asked me to tell the story of how I met my husband. You'll find out why their podcast is titled, Did You Get My Text? and a lot more. Our first caller today is Lindsay, whose boyfriend is hesitant to get married, making her question her own desire to have that official piece of paper. Next, we talk with Violet, who questions the friendship she has with her former college roommate, wonders how to back out of attending her wedding, and worries about the aftermath. Meredith and Patton give terrific advice, and you'll soon know why they're my new favorite couple. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Patton. Hey guys. Look how pretty you are. Oh God. My husband is a cinematographer. You are lit so well. There is a Caleb Deschanel, <laughs> Gordon Willis thing going on there that is wow. I wish I knew those references, Patton. <laughs> Patton, you must be a man of statistics. Sort of. He's a man of encyclopedic <laughs> knowledge of which you will never get any reference, he says. He can go down a rabbit hole of every author, poet, musician, Marvel character. He's an encyclopedic savant. Of useless knowledge. Yeah. What heroes do you identify with and why? Who the one obviously that I identify with is Spider-Man only because that's the one hero where they consistently show you that no matter what superpowers you have, life still happens and life is still a hassle. And it's such a great, for people that are pursuing fame or fortune, they're like, all my problems will go away if I get object X and Spider-Man shows you. But if I had superpowers, I still gotta earn money. I gotta take care of my aunt. I got problems at school. I just love that those two tensions are always going on with that character. That makes sense. Meredith, I need to tell you that Natty Gann was incredibly formative for me and my life. Oh, I love you. I love that you know that movie. I not only love it, but you were part of a collection like you and Megan Follows from Anne of Green Gables, the Canadian. Yes. That just was incredibly inspiring. So thank oh. you. Watching that movie, you are a very instinctual actor. I mean, I was probably eight or nine when it came out. And the moment of reunification, I was crying, but my dad was so audibly sobbing. Oh. It was like something had been bottled up in him. And I won't ever forget that. Anyway, I'm actually getting a little, it's too oh, early for me man. to get emotional. <laughs> I love that. That means so much to me. Did you see it in a theater? No, I didn't oh, see it in a okay. theater. I saw it on VHS many, wow. many, many times. Yes. Patton, you seem very deliberate in your creation of the variety of characters that you play, mm -hmm. your very specific point of view with each character. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, that is, because if I don't know what that character's point of view is, I'll slip back into myself, which is this jokey comedic thing, which does not serve the character. So I do have to be very specific about who I'm playing. Yeah. Okay, Meredith, your turn. Good answer, Patton. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everyone has sort of a different acting style. I think, you know, when I first started taking acting class when I was a little girl, when I was like eight years old, I studied from this really lovely lady in Malibu. That's where I'm from. And it was just like a group of kids, but it was all very real. Like none of it was for commercials. None of it was for television. It wasn't to be an actor. It was just to take acting class. And like, I just remember the first time we were sort of all in a room together and she was like, okay, all you kids just get in the center of the room, get on the floor 
Now everyone lay down except Meredith. And then everyone lay down. And then she's like, okay, Meredith, the plane just crashed. And these are all your best friends. And I just was like sobbing. And you know what it is? I feel like It just feels very real for me. There's not an official technique as much as it's just embody who that person is and then just go. It just is what it is. Not that I didn't study all the different techniques because I did later in life. You know, I took from a lot of really great acting teachers, but I think just the original beginnings of my thing is I was just a very dramatic child. Me too. (laughs) I just wanted to be taken seriously. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it was just very much like, I think a lot of kids today, they get into acting they're like, I want to be famous or I'm cute and I live in Texas and I'll just go to LA because I'm cute or I have a TikTok account and I'm hot and how do I be famous? And I think when I was little, it wasn't about that at all. It was just like, let's just play. Let's just get into some other character. Now, that said, I have seen Meredith immerse herself in character. She played Sue Mangers in a pilot and she transformed. She became not Meredith for a couple days and it was pretty deep. Do you know who Sue Mangers is? No, oh. I was going to ask you, would you mind? Sue Manger was like one of the most famous talent agents in the oh. late 70s. She represented Barbara Streisand and Mick Jagger. Legendary. Just everybody. She was best friends with Barbara Streisand. She kind of looked like Barbara Streisand. She looked like Gloria Steinem mixed with Barbara Streisand with the huge glasses and the calf tans <laughs> and the long nails and smoking cigarettes. I'm so bummed this pilot didn't go. I am too. It was so good. And she had a New York accent-ish and they're doing a huge movie about her now. On Bullseye with Jesse Thorne, you spoke about how you met. Would you mind recounting that story? Because I think it's also a nice intro to your podcast as well. Yes. Go ahead, Meredith. Yeah. Well, I grew up in this business and one of my dear friends since I was 15 years old is Martha Plimpton, who's also an actress. She's wonderful. Well, first of all, she's so freaking talented, but she's also like always has like interesting friends from all walks of life and different artistic endeavors. And she would have these dinner parties at her house and she invited 15 people to dinner at her house on a Facebook text thread. So she invited 15 people and you could see everybody who was invited. Everybody went except Patton. And the next day I had written on the text thread, Martha, that was the best dinner party ever. And then I wrote, dude, you missed the best fucking lasagna. I love it. And then he was online and he texted me and he's like, oh, I was supposed to be there. And we ended up texting back and forth to each other for about two hours. And it wasn't flirty. We didn't really know each other at all. We were just sort of chatting. But that's kind of when you can be the most reckless. Absolutely. Like the most real. Because we weren't trying to be flirty with each other. I just remember my mom always saying to me, like, you're never going to meet someone at home in bed. Like, you need to go out and meet people. And I was like at home, in bed, in my pajamas, just texting. (laughs) And so then it was like, we texted for two hours and then it was late. And he was like, this was fun. Same time tomorrow? And I was like, sure. And Trump had just gotten elected president. It was a nightmare. We were just talking about, can you believe like he's a Russian asset? Like, you know, we were just just like- Just the reality we're in, like what is going on? It felt good to talk to someone else who was sane, you know? Completely. Yeah. And so for three months straight, two hours every single night, we were texting. We never spoke on the phone never met. And around two months into it, I was like falling in love with him. I'd never met anyone so intelligent and kind. But I was also terrified because I was like, what if when I meet him in person, I'm not going to like him because I was single for so long and I didn't like anyone. And there was always a reason why I didn't like someone for just the stupidest reasons. Like, oh, he has low ears. Like I couldn't, (laughs) just stupid reasons. And I just thought I wasn't going to like him. And I was really anxious and I thought, oh, we'll meet for 45 minutes and we'll have a coffee and then it'll be done and then I'll have broken his heart, maybe if he liked me. But then we met and we met in person and I was overwhelmed with like, oh my God, you're so cute and adorable. And I started sweating and I started getting angry and I was, and I was fell in love. And then I was like head over heels. At what point I wonder, did the banter of this intense texting shift into almost caring? Like, asleep well. Uh, Oh, yeah. Well, it started out just, you know, talking about the world and stuff. And then at one point, he had posted a picture of Alice. And I was like, oh, man. I said, she's so cute. She looks like she might be the same age as my niece. I was like, I'm so sorry that she lost her mom. And I'm, I'm so sorry you lost your wife. And that's when we sort of started talking about real things. And so it got very real. 
but it wasn't flirty for about two months. And then we were talking about an actress or something, and he's saying, oh, you should see this movie. And I was like, oh, that actress is gorgeous. And then he sent something like, you're gorgeous. And I was like, oh, (laughs) that's a good man, Patton. Although you could almost argue that I was stating an objective fact. I mean, in a way that's not flirty because she is. It is. It was just like, you're gorgeous. It's, you know. No, no. It's flirty. Well, it it was also flirty. It's loving is what it is. Yes. It is. It's very sweet. But then that made me very anxious because I was like, oh, no, does he think this is flirting? Like, (laughs) it's been two months every night. Are we flirting with each other? Is that what this is? And I got really anxious about it and didn't want that to be the trajectory of our conversations. But then that night I was like, what's wrong with me? He's amazing. Is this flirt? I think I love him. Like, I just, just opened the floodgates. Do you think that being, because I met my husband, Michael, when I was, how old was I, 40? Thinking about finding love at a slightly older place in life mm-hmm. and the value in that. Yeah. Well, we were coming from different places. Patton had been married for 10 years and he had a child and he suffered a huge tragedy and loss. So his place in life was so much different than mine. And I don't know if you want to talk about it. Well, I mean, you know, we had been together for three years, then we'd been married for 10 and had a daughter. And that was just my life. And then it was like, very, very rudely ripped away. I honestly don't know what's worse, a sudden death or friends of mine who've lost spouses who it was a lingering long. I don't know what is worse, but I was in that state of fear and unreality of, I don't even know if I'm alive, right? There were moments during the recovery where I didn't know that I was alive. And I think the thing about Meredith was we didn't come at it as romance. We almost started relating to each other the way that a couple that had been married for five or six years relates to each other. That's how we started, which is talking in the dark at the end of the day, which is what you do, which is such a thing that I love about being with someone you're in love with. You just are together at the end of the day and go, wow, what was that? And you just can like confirm reality with each other, basically. So that's kind of where I was coming from. But I know that Meredith, you were coming from a much different energy and a much different place. Yeah. I mean, I met him when I was 47. And, you know, I've had 7 billion boyfriends in my life, some very long term, some short, but I've dated everybody. What? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Were you ever close to engagement or did you get engaged? No, I was never close. I mean, I dated lots of very bad boys. And even though I was with some of them for quite a long time, I still knew in the back of my mind, like, I'm not marrying any of these insane actors who clearly at some point will cheat on me. Like, I had amazing relationships. I refer to them as adventures. And I think I really knew that they were adventures from the beginning. And I was just having the best time because I had no responsibility. I had my own career. I had my own life. And I'm obsessed with children. And I'm sort of like Mary Poppins. I mean, there's a hashtag on Instagram that says anti Mare extraordinaire. And I have all my friends' kids, and I was very much fulfilled in my life with my friends' children. And I just assume there's nobody really out there for me. There's all these fabulous, crazy adventure people that are fun to be with, but there's no one who's like smart and loving and kind and all the good things and support. Everything Patton is, I never thought that could possibly exist. And so I dated all those crazy people and I was single for a really long time. So I just didn't assume I would. And when I was chatting with him, I was just like, well, here's some friend who I'll just probably have as a friend. And he's so interesting and smart. So when I did fall in love, it was like very surprising to me. I really didn't think I would ever get married because I just didn't think someone like Patton existed. And also someone like Patton who did exist, I didn't think I could possibly be attracted to. (laughs) When you guys were first dating, here's how I imagine it. I imagine, Meredith, you were anxious on like a normal first date level. And Patton, you may have been in this state where it's like, well, what do I have to lose? No, I was anxious. You were. Yeah, because over the three months that we had texted, I really encountered her mind and her personality. So it was a different kind of anxious where it's not, oh my gosh, I don't want to look stupid in front of this pretty girl. It's, I don't want to be dumb in front of this smart girl, this really intelligent, you know, we've been talking. As you said, it's very easy to be glib and funny over text, but then when you're actually face to face, that's a whole different monster. And I didn't know, what if I freeze up? What if I, I didn't know what was going to happen, but it was a different 
kind of first date tension. We already had fallen in love for real. Yeah. Like I felt like if we like each other, that's my husband. I had already fallen in love with him online. Listen, a two hour <laughs> nonstop texting exchange is like seven dates. Because on a date, you have to drive there, you have to sit there, you have to look cute, you have to be like, can I get a drink, please? And then you're like, haha, that waitress is so funny. But like, when you're really talking with someone, you really, really, really get to know someone. And three months of this, at two hours every night, we're getting into some deep stuff. Also, I would like reference a book and then the next day she'd go, okay, I read that. <laughs> and I'm like, when did you read it? She goes, last night when I got off the thing with you. I'm like, what? You didn't read that. She goes, no, there's this whole section I wanted to talk to you about. I'm like, oh my God. So like that level of engagement and smarts was, oh dear God. I already knew that I loved his soul. My worry was, oh my God, am I going to think he's cute or am I going to be like, we have no <laughs> chemistry whatsoever. And so I was worried to meet him because I was worried that after I had fallen in love with this person that I was going to be that hideous human that I've been for the last 10 years who never found anyone worthy or that I was interested in spending my life with. And I'm going to just go, oh God, what have I done? Uh, nice to meet you. Bye. But at the end of the 45 minutes, I was like, do you want to walk on the beach? <laughs> and then we did. And I was like, do you want to get dinner? And then we had dinner. Like, it was the first time I ever had a date that I just wanted to stay on. And you were proactive. She was. Because you guys already had a trust. Yeah, You guys exactly. could count on each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anna, how did you meet your DP boyfriend? Was he lensing you for a shot and suddenly your eyes met through the focal plane? Or what happened? Patton, I love this. <laughs> we were on a movie called Overboard up in Vancouver. Wait, I love that. I love that movie. <laughs> oh, thank you. It was really fun. My life was like going through a lot of turmoil at that time. And we were the only two people staying in this smaller boutique hotel. There was like a producer dinner one night and I had blown off the previous one because, you know, it's that kind of a dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I felt obligated to go to this one. So I was coming down the elevator and he stepped in and I had this wave of relief that took me by complete surprise, actually. I don't even think we had talked much at all during the shoot. And this is maybe like four weeks into the shoot. And I said, oh, thank God you're going to the dinner too. Oh, I'm so glad. Can we ride together? I arranged a car with the hotel. And he said, yeah, sure. And I felt glued to him all night. I invited him out on a walk after dinner. Just like us? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was just chatting his ear off. But what I found out later was that he wasn't planning on going to that dinner. He had made reservations for himself at this incredibly high-end, like, eight-person sushi restaurant up there. But you were like, oh, thank God you're going. So he was like, yeah, I'm going. Yeah. Oh, my that, God, that's the cutest thing wow. I've ever Wow. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. He blew off amakaze for you. Totally. That's totally. beautiful. And he took me there later. It was the most amazing meal. And I realize the sacrifice he had made. <laughs> so how could I not marry him? <laughs> but there was just a sense of safety and security and kind of reassurance that I didn't even know I was kind of looking for. Especially as I get older, I think I've always been kind of a... A loner sounds too dramatic, but an introvert sounds too narrow of a box, I guess. Well, I think a lot of actors are in that same boat. It's sort of like there's the hermit side of you that just wants to stay home and be a homebody. And then there's that part of you where like, I'm on the red carpet. I know all these celebrities too. And I'm just going to say hi to everyone. And, boop, 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 boop. and there's that time when you feel like you want to be out. And then there's that time where you're just like, I just need my person just to be quiet with. Are you guys big travelers? Well, yeah. We used to be. We all used to be big travelers. Now it's so nervy. But he has to travel all the time. You know, as a stand-up comedian, he has gigs. And I love saying that he has gigs. <laughs> and he's a Grammy winner. It's like I'm married to a rock star. Yeah. Or he's got a gig. He's got gigs and he's a Grammy he's winner. A but he's got like his stand-up stuff in every city, every weekend. So he's always on a plane. But traveling, like, we would love to be traveling. We want to take our daughter to Paris. We want to show her the catacombs. There's so many things we want to do. And I feel very scared to do anything right now. And not just because of coronavirus, because, you know, just like terrorism. I know. And then all the people who have to fight on airplanes. What's wrong with you people? All the ones who are like, I'm not putting my mask on. And then they start a fight with the flight attendant and they make it scary for everyone. And it's just like going places with this world now. People are so combative and scary. Like people want to fight for no reason. It's weird. It doesn't feel like there's any place to flee to. Like, 
oh my God, I'd love to go to Europe. But you're like, well, Europe might break out in war now. So can we go there? Or like, there doesn't seem to be any escape hatches left anymore. It's like we've become, as a society, completely addicted to anxiety. Yeah. I was talking about this the other day, like, God, it's so nice to meet you, Anna. And I would love to like get a drink with you. And like, if you're out and you're having a drink with a friend and you want to like have fun and chat and talk, but like there's this underlying war in Ukraine and there's so much homeless here and healthcare, people can't afford it and schools don't get enough. The infrastructure is terrible. And there's this underlying hell Mm -hmm. that exists. Voting rights are being stripped and all these things that currently exist and they all need to be addressed and they are all of equal value. And I'm very political. I work very hard to fundraise. And so you work so hard for these things, but there is this underneath anxiety, like the world really needs help. Like you really want to get your friends activated to make the world a better place. And there's that anxiety in addition to like the stuff you normally do. You're writing a script or you're starring in this thing that you kind of have to like put that knowledge of the hell into a little basket so you can be with your kid and like snuggle. But yet you all acknowledge like there's this terrible stuff underneath. So it is like that underlying static that you can't get rid of. Totally. So favorite rainy day movie? Go ahead, Meredith. So here's the thing about a rainy day. It's very emotional. Mm -hmm. And when I think emotional things, I think of like my childhood. So for me, a rainy day movie that would be a great movie is like The Black Stallion or like The Muppet Movie. Perfect choices. Yeah. That energy of a rainy day feels like that kind of a movie. I love that. So mine too, just like Meredith said, it's either I go back to my childhood, which is on rainy days on Sundays, it was a mid-afternoon movie your dad would usually watch with you. And mine is The Taking of Pelham 123 with Walter Matthau. Oh, I love Walter Watching Matthau. that movie with your dad. And it's also just a great crime caper. And weirdly, by accident, a documentary about how god-awful New York was in the early 70s. <laughs> And then the other one is the 1974 Murder on the Orient Express with Albert Finney. Oh. I've seen that movie so many times. I love it. I just love it. Were you also a Death on the Nile fan? I don't like the Ustinov Hercule Poirot. I like the Albert Finney Hercule Poirot. Ustinov is not put together as well. And and I love Ustinov, but he's not a good Poirot. Oh, but come on, Mia Farrow on top of a pyramid? (laughs) (laughs) Like... Anna, you literally turned into like the money man producer of that, like in the studio. Guys, Mia Farrow on top of a pyramid. What are we not yeah. doing? Why are we still talking? Let's go shoot it. <gasps> <laughs> oh, God. If only. Mia Farrow on top of a pyramid. And me was fucking rad. What was your rainy day movie? Yeah. Well, I would have gone with the original Overboard. I love that movie so much. Yeah. Oh my God. I do too. It's a great movie. I want to ask you both about heartbreak you've experienced. Of course, Patton, you've gone through the worst imaginable. The biggest heartbreak ever. I had the biggest heartbreak. But also before that, I had your very bog standard high school heartbreak, long distance college relationship heartbreak, you know, just stuff that didn't work out. So this is going to sound like I'm blowing off anyone who's coming for advice. But the only thing that gets you over heartbreak is time. And in time, you're able to then deal with other heartbreaks that come your way because you'll have the memory of getting over the other ones. It's almost like you're building up a resistance. But to get the resistance, you have to let the heartbreak just rush over you like a tsunami and just not try to hide from it, which is a very hard thing to do. If you're looking at like high school relationships and stuff, it feels like the longer your relationship It takes like half that amount of time to get over it. Yeah. But if you have a short relationship, it feels like it takes double the amount of time to get over it. (laughs) It's age, too. Yeah. Like the sear of a heartbreak at age 18. Yeah. Yes. It's like, Uh, that's hardcore. And by the way, that was also why when Meredith and I met, we got married very quickly because we were older and because we'd been through so many relationships. When you get older, you know who you are better. You don't need to go through all the, but I still got to find myself. Like, no, I met this person. She's sane. She's awesome. We can just fast forward because we know enough to know when you found the person you should be with when you're older. I think that happens way faster. This is like the perfect segue into our first caller. Ooh. Because she is wondering about marriage with her boyfriend. Lindsay! Lindsay! Oh my 
my God. What's up? Hi. You're here with Patton and Meredith. Hi. We're excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for your letter. Will you tell us all what's going on? Yeah. So I have been dating my boyfriend for two and a half years. We've lived together for a year and a half. And I am kind of getting to the stage where I'm ready for more of a commitment. So getting engaged and married. And he's not really ready for that for a variety of reasons. So when we've had these discussions in the past, he's kind of just asked, you know, what is marriage really going to change for us? He kind of likes the way things are. So I was just wondering if you guys had any advice on, you know, is a marriage certificate, what does it actually change or do for you as a couple? And, you know, if you have any advice on how to cope while I wait. Lindsay, will you give us a little background? In your letter, you talk about the moving stress and sort of what you've given up is maybe an incorrect way to phrase it. Yeah. So I've moved twice for him to pursue his career. Luckily, my employment hasn't changed through that. My employer with COVID has kind of moved to remote work. So I've been able to keep my job. But, you know, I've always been really independent. And right now I kind of feel like I'm just following my boyfriend around. And, you know, we're having to make a lot of big commitments to each other without having being more than just boyfriend and girlfriend. You have a lot of friends and family say, hey, when are you guys getting married? Yeah, I grew up in a small religious town in Idaho. And so all of the influential people in my life, you know, all got married in their early 20s and were done having kids by the age of 30. So it's pretty unusual for me to be almost 30 and have none of those things. So yeah, I get a lot of questions from both of our families and friends, you know, when are you guys going to get married? And it's pretty uncomfortable question to answer because I'm ready, but he's not. He's not ready to get married, but does he want to be married eventually? Does he see you as his forever person? Yeah. Yeah. We talk about what our plans are in the future. When we got together and in fairness, he had communicated that he didn't know if marriage was for him. But as we've grown together and built our life together, he's saying now that you know marriage is something he wants to do, but not right now. And I never would want to pressure him or you know force somebody into marriage because that's not going to create success. So I read your letter as well. And it really struck me how you have a lot more insight than I think you're giving yourself credit for because you're very much aware of some of this might be subconsciously because of my upbringing. A lot of this could be illusory, this pressure that I'm feeling. So because you know all that about yourself, part of me almost wants to advise you to just let this play out for a little bit longer because I think that the answers are there subconsciously only because you have so much awareness of what is causing a lot of this tension. But obviously, I'd also like to hear some more. I agree. Yeah. Well, were you a person who always wanted to get married? Yeah, I always saw myself getting married. You know, I guess thinking back to when I was younger, I always just assumed that I'd follow the path that I saw everybody else on. As I've grown and made different choices, I am realizing that, you know, my path doesn't have to be the same. So it's kind of an adjustment for me to keep making changes to my own path and try to ignore the pressure externally. I think that's the biggest key is you're making changes to your path. And listen, Patton and I got married very early. He had a little girl and well, first of all, I wanted to marry him, but I also felt like it's important for her to know this is like a real thing. I'm not going anywhere. No one's ever going to leave you again. You need to feel safe and secure. And so to be married is to give a sense of security to the child. Like, I'm not leaving you. You're mine now. And in your situation, to be married is really to give yourself the like, yes, we're going to be together so we can embark on all the changes that our lives are going through together. This is a commitment that's not going anywhere so I can continue to follow you or to do all these life changes with you. If you were just staying in one place and you weren't changing your life to keep doing all these things for him, I would say it's not really that important to get married. It doesn't matter that you're 30 or whatever you are. A certificate changes nothing other than to show the other person like we are a team. I'm putting all my trust in us together. 
But I do think there are many people, I mean, look at Anna was talking about, she did the sequel to Overboard. Goldie Hawn is not married to Kurt Russell, but they have an amazing relationship of not being married. And I think you can say you want to be together forever, but you're sort of looking for the security of like, I'm doing all these big changes in life and I'm willing to do all this because I love you and want to be with you. But I feel like I need the security of knowing that I'm going to embark on all these changes knowing that this is a real thing, right? So do I think having the certificate is that important? No, I really don't. And for the sake of other people, I think it doesn't matter for that either. Your mom wants you to get married, who cares? My mom wanted me to get married a million times. And I was like, (laughs) it has to be right. But if you know that this person's right for you and he has expressed that you are right for him, I don't think you need the certificate, but I think if you are making these big life choices of buying a house and or moving, I think maybe it would feel safer for you. Yeah. You know, I think a lot about how relationships, the balance is always in flux. And if you're somewhere in like the 60-40 idea, that's good. But if one partner is feeling like they're giving a lot more Then, of course, resentment builds and it's like, well, what are you giving to me? How are you proving to me that you're invested as much as I am? Were the moves like big geographical changes for you? They were about two hours away from each other. So neither of us lived near our family. So that's not really a factor. So geographically, not a huge change, but still uprooting your life. And I was really sad to leave our last spot. Yeah, because you probably had a sense of community there. And I think it's kind of easy to, if there is an imbalance, to channel it in one direction. Does him not wanting to get married yet make you feel like he's not truly invested? Does it give you a sense of instability or like concern or anxiety and worry? No, I think his reasons for not wanting to get married right now, they logically make sense. So I can respect those. One of them, he doesn't want to enter marriage with loans. So he's trying to pay off his student loan debt. That's good for you. Yeah, yeah. I can't complain about that. His parents just recently got divorced. So there's some sensitivity around that. Oh. And his mom is not in good health. So, you know, we've been dealing with all of these issues together and we're a really good team, you know, so I totally understand where it's coming from. You're still really young, unless it was like he needs to move to Paris for his job and you're giving up your whole life in California. I think that these moves aren't drastic, like across the country, away from family or anything really other than you liked where you were living. They don't seem to be drastic changes to me, but you know, you feel how you feel. It just seems to me like, how long have you been together? Two and a half years. Yeah, I think you guys are young and I don't know. I think if you trust that he's going to be there for you, give it some time because if you're not, you don't want to get divorced. And the fact that he's keeping things in mind, like the student loan and the fact that, you know, there's sensitivity around his parent, like he's being very thoughtful about it. And you seem to be pretty firmly grounded. I think you could give this some time. Yeah. Well, are you overall happy together? That's the question. Yes. Yeah, I think Meredith hit it on the head where I'm just looking for more of that security maybe that comes with furthering a a relationship. And I, you know, given the option, I'd much rather wait 10 years than not be with him. So I guess more of my questions are like now, how do I cope with waiting? I think ultimately you're young, you love each other. It's not about getting married and proving to your parents or your friends Yeah, that shouldn't be even on your mind because truly it's really for you. And I would look at it not as waiting to get married. I would just look at it like, here's where we are. This is our relationship and figure out, you know, while you're together, is this the person who supports me and loves me and makes me feel my best self? Do I love him and support him and want him to be his best self and just live in your daily life? And if all those things are still there, you get married. And if they're not still there, you don't get married. And if they aren't there, getting married is not going to put them back. Yeah, she's right. And Lindsay, I would tell like friends and family, we've just had so much change. Like we're going to wait to think about that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And anyone you know will absolutely understand that line of reasoning because we've all been through it. Everyone's going to understand that immediately. Yeah. I'm really happy that you guys are so happy, though. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, thanks. (laughs) And like I see it in your face that you 
really are like in love with him. And I'm sure he's in love with you if you're so happy, you know. Mm -hmm. And you want him to be really ready. Yeah. You want him to want to be married. And until then, you guys are together. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's all good. Yep. I think he is my person. So definitely worth waiting for. Yay. (laughs) Yeah. Yay. Wait till you know, Lindsay. I waited till I was 47. It doesn't matter. It's not about it. It's just about you guys. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your advice. Lindsay, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye, Lindsay. Bye. You were both so wonderful. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. (laughs) Oh, totally was. You're so sweet. Yeah. You're just so sweet and dear with your big (laughs) eye. You're like a little angel. You're like a little deer. Go on, Meredith. (laughs) You are. You're like a little Disney cartoon character. You're so cute. Nobody talks to me this way in the shoemaking factory. (laughs) (laughs) She's like a little pixie. (gasps) You've been doing this podcast for years? Yes. Wow. How often do you release a podcast? We release once a week on Mondays. You guys... Once a week on Tuesdays. It's a lot of work. Yes. It takes a lot of time. Well, it's a lot of work if you want to do it well. There are a billion podcasts out there now, and what you realize is 90% of them are just people just going, so what else is going on? Um... I guess I bought some shrimp today. Like, there's no preparation. So the good ones, they take time. Yeah. Basically, it's Meredith and I, and I'm sure a lot of people experience this. We live in a house together, but for some reason, we just text each other all day. Even when we're 40 feet apart, we kind of decode the texts after a week. If we see an article one of us likes, a weird picture, a video, or just something that we're doing, And it's a relationship decoded through texts, and it's quite feisty and fun, and we really go at it. And Meredith is just hilarious and wonderful because I go down these insane rabbit holes. And because she's so honest to a fault, she'll just go, I stopped listening right when you said. (laughs) That's not good. He's like, this is a podcast. You have to listen to me. Yeah. Like, this is the form where you actually have to listen to me. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I zoned out. Yeah. What were you saying? Like, I'm sorry. And also, I don't get half his references. Right. He's so encyclopedic with his knowledge about everything. And I'm just like, who, what? I don't know. I don't know what that reference was, but I'm sure someone listening probably gets it. There's an episode like five episodes back where I told this really, what I thought fascinating, but convoluted story that linked the Texas Chainsaw Massacre with a film that was being shot at the same time outside of Austin by Sidney Lumet. So I told this whole long story and then I mentioned Sidney Lumet and Meredith, who's been checking her phone, just goes, Sidney Lumet, I met him. <laughs> it's like a person in a coma and then you play them like a song they like and they're like, oh, they come out of it for a second. And that's what it was like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a really long story and I really did tune out. And then he said something that I was like, oh. I met Sidney Lumet. I'm like, what? were you even listening to me? So there's a lot of that. And also like we talk about, there was one night we were in bed together. I saw something and I went, oh my God, look at this. And I was holding my phone up, but she had found this perfect position. We were back to back in bed. Our backs were towards each other and I'd found this perfect position for my neck and my whole everything. And he's like, oh, I want to show you something. And he wanted me to like turn over. To, and I was like, can you just text it to me because I'm in a perfect position. Yeah, I don't want to lose this position. He had his phone, I had my phone. And he literally texted to me in bed. And this was a position in her defense. It involved like three pillows, two small pillows. Like it was a whole engineering feat. I was comfy. (laughs) Okay, so now we're talking with Violet. Hey, Violet. Hi. Hi. This is Meredith and Patton. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Patton. Hi. Hi. It's so nice to meet you. So nice to meet you guys. Will you tell us what's going on? Yes. So I have a old college roommate. We used to be best friends in college. And then we no longer really are. We're just kind of acquaintances. We're nice. And she invited me to her wedding and I don't really want to go and I don't know how to tell her and I don't want to hurt her feelings, but I just don't think going would be a very good thing. And that's basically what I need help figuring out and how to tell her because I do think I need to tell her. And then kind of moving forward with how to be her friend or maybe not. I don't really know. (laughs) 
Will you tell us a little bit about your friendship in college, what that was like? Yes. So we were kind of best friends in college, very different personalities. She's very big and loud and I'm not so much that way, but she was in a sorority and she had like two different majors and a minor. I was just a BFA, had one. And soon I started to realize like we were really great friends. Kind of after we started living together, I started realizing that our friendship was like really one-sided. It was really hard work. An example where she was dating someone, she loved him and it was great. I was just always there for her and it was always about them. And then they broke up and I was there for her like a lot. And it was like, I had to be there. And then I started dating someone my senior year and it was all of a sudden like, you don't pay enough attention to me and we're not friends anymore. And it was kind of like, okay, but you also hang out with your sorority girls all the time. And it was just a very one-sided friendship. So after I graduated, she stayed because she had a lot of things to do. And I kind of just distanced myself from her. I probably didn't do a very good job at doing that. I kind of just was like, I have to find myself and grow up a little bit. And I wanted to focus on my career. And it just seemed like that college life was just really all her circle and what she wanted. And then I moved to New York and I don't know, I just didn't stay in touch that well, but yeah, that was just kind of our friendship. And then I've seen her like a handful of times since, and it's been fine, but she's just a very high maintenance person. Do you want to stay friends with her or you want to be friendly with her? If you see her, you want to be like, hey, I want to be friendly with her. Yes. And then I guess a more recent, I've seen her like last year where I went to do a show where she lives, a different friend show. So I reached out and I was like, hey, let's get dinner. Selfishly, in part, because I didn't want her to be like... You were in town and... Yeah, and she right. didn't call me. So we had dinner and it was just a lot of backhanded comments towards me. And my whole point was like, we all grow, we all change. It's been like nine years and she's still friends with everyone from college because we all hang out in a huge big group. I don't know. I guess my gut was just like, this is weird. The tension was kind of thick and resentment, I guess. It's just weird. I was telling my boyfriend about it and I had gotten a Google form from her right after we had dinner. And she's like, can you just send me your address so I can send you an invitation to the wedding? And I told my boyfriend who we all went to college together and he was like, I got that Google form like a month or two ago. Oh, man. He was like, I don't think this is the best thing for you. And I was like, I agree. I just think I was always in college. So like, oh, I got to make her happy. I got to make her happy. And then I realized I was like, I can't do this. So yeah, I don't want to hurt her feelings. I just. Yeah, but you don't have to make anyone happy. And you're not that close. It's not like she'll be devastated if you're not at her wedding. And also, my question is, why can't you just be like, oh, thank you for thinking of me. That was so thoughtful of you. I'm actually not able to come. And you don't have to say yeah. why. You don't have to say I'm going to my sister's bat mitzvah. You don't have to say anything. You just say, that was so thoughtful of you to think of me. I'm actually not able to come, but I wish you the best, happiest marriage. And when you see her, it's like, hey. And if you're in a group of friends, it's like, oh, it's so nice to see you. You don't need to lie. And you don't also need to tell the truth, like, I don't really want to come, because unless you're trying to make some relationship where you guys are super honest, you're not trying to be best friends with her in the future. So my personal opinion is you don't have to say, I really don't want to come because that's hurtful. You also don't have to say why you can't come. I will say I did have an experience. I just want to throw it out there and I kind of feel bad about it. But when I married Patton, we only had X amount of people at our wedding. I had five roommates. Two of them I'm still best friends with. Three of them I love, but I'll see you when I see you. I don't call them all the time. I don't keep in touch with them. They're going to be at the reunion. I'm so excited to see them. But I did feel the need to call them and say, I love you guys so much. We have such a small wedding and I feel bad not inviting you, but I wanted you to know that you are still my heart and still one of my favorite people. And we're just doing a smaller wedding. And you obviously know that Jen and Joelle are my best friends. And then mm -hmm. I felt awkward about it. I should have just not said anything. <laughs> I think it was really beautiful what you did. I just didn't want them to be like, you got married and didn't invite me. So I was sort of like, just wanted to go, I want you to know we're having a super small wedding and I love you, but I just can't invite everybody. And they got it. Can I ask a couple of quick questions, Violet? Sure. Where do you currently live? In New York. And where's the wedding? In Missouri. This is my two cents. It feels like 
this friend of yours, who I'm sure is a very nice person. Wants a present. Not only wants a present, <laughs> but I think that it feels like she has sort of frozen in college. Yeah. And she wants to keep that energy going. And some people in the friend group are clearly still totally in that same energy, totally want to be with that. Absolutely. Go to Missouri. You are not in that energy anymore. You have moved on with your own thing and you can't disrupt your life and put yourself through a miserable weekend to prop up someone else's nostalgia. This sounds like nostalgia. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a destination wedding. Yeah. Usually when people have a destination wedding, they don't expect people to come unless you're like core, core, core core group. Yeah. Right. My God, you have so many outs here. You're totally cool. Just go, I can't make it. Yeah, you're really right. I really do. I think I just have always spent like so much time trying to avoid like maybe walking on eggshells around her. Yeah. And so that's why I'm like, everyone else is going to be there. I bet everyone else is not going to be there. I bet at the last minute, a couple of people are going to go, yeah, I can't. I can't do this. And I think it's rough that she kind of broke your heart. Yeah. It's not cool. Yeah. If we were to say, Violet, we really think you should go to the wedding. Mm -hmm. What's your initial gut reaction to that idea? <laughs> okay, right there, you just answered it. You just went, <laughs> <Yeah. "Ugh." laughs> I think I do know the feeling that I just don't want to. I think that if I went, that I would get a couple selfies. Right. And that she is going to be surrounded by so many people because it's a big wedding and she has been planning it. But it was just the thought, I guess, if I don't go, which I don't want to. If you don't want to, don't go. Any grumblings you get from people, they are grumbling from a time that no longer exists. Yes. They are gossiping from an energy yes. that existed back in college that actually does not exist now. Right. That time has moved on. It doesn't affect anything. Mm -hmm. I agree. I really honestly wasn't expecting an invite. And then when I got one, she would text me, which we don't really talk. And then it's like, did you get your invite? Did oh, you get it? Man. Are you and uh, so I'm telling you, she's asking no. for a present. Yeah. If you're invited, you're obligated to send a present. Yeah. And again, it's like, I don't want to hurt her feelings. If I do go, maybe she wouldn't notice me, but there's also the chance that if I don't, everyone, it would be like, where is Violet? So you're busy. Who cares? Who cares? Isn't this a situation where a white lie is fine? Absolutely. Here's the thing. You don't have to tell people why you can't come. You just say you can't come. And the truth is you can't come because you don't want to come, but you don't have to tell her that. Right. You cannot feed into this drama, not to brag on our daughter, but she has a lot of dramatic friends. And when they start getting drama and gossipy, she doesn't engage in the drama. She just walks away for a while until they calm down and then they will engage with her on the level that she's comfortable with. And when you have friends, the friends that I'm sure there'll be some gossip and, oh my God, you didn't come to the wedding. And all you got to do is like, yeah, I couldn't make it. And that's all the energy you give it. If she didn't include you, it would have been rude. She included you to be nice. But the fact of the matter is you just say you can't make it and everybody's happy. I just probably worry too much about what people think. And so I, you're right. I need to not do that. But when she gets the questions of, oh my God, I can't believe you're not going. And Amy's really hurt that you're not going to be there. I couldn't make it. Couldn't make it. Sorry, couldn't make it. And then if you feel like you need to make something up to make other people feel okay, white lies in that situation are not a big deal. Mm -hmm. No one can blame like finance. Like I'm saving up, you know? Yeah. Right. And I do really have like a lot of jobs. So I can't go. I can't leave because of work. Yeah. Can't go. Yeah. I'm busy. Sorry. Let them live in college forever. Yeah. Go ahead. That's not your drama. Yeah. You're sweet to care yeah. about other people's feelings, yeah. but the person whose feelings matter most are yours. Yes. You don't want to go. You just don't. And so it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks or says. You just don't go because you don't want to. It's as easy as that. And you don't have to say why. You're also feeling a level of guilt that I feel too, which is here's what you're partially guilty about. You have made up your mind not to go and you're actually kind of cool with it. And then you feel bad that I shouldn't actually be this cool with it. So you're putting yourself through this, so you'll feel better, but you're actually, you're totally okay with it. And this will never cross your mind again. And just accept that. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've gone back and forth with my boyfriend and even my like sister. I was like, I think I should go. And they're like, no, you should not. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, you're right. I don't want to go. Yeah, I, want, I, don't, I don't need to go. It's only you that matters. You're living your own life. Yes. And you don't have to do it to please other people. And there's always a way to do it kindly to live the life you want. You mm -hmm. have to be putting yourself first. You must. 
And you're a kind person to think of other people's feelings. You really are. Thank you. But you don't have to punish yourself to be nice to someone else. Thanks. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I've also learned from your podcast. Like, I think I heard one time someone say like, we only think about romantic relationships ending and we don't always think about friendships. And yes, that immediately made me think of this person. And then it kind of all started. And then I was like, oh no, I can't. Yeah. I think I've avoided it too long. Well, it's a good recognition when you are able to be like, that made me feel bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't quite know why. And I wish it didn't. I feel like it's almost harder with a friend, the loss of a friend than it is of a boyfriend. Oh yeah. Or a husband or whatever. I mean, those are hard, but friends, it's such a different thing. It's Mm -hmm. very hard. It kills me when I lose things with a friend and I just... I know how you feel. There's an amazing short novel you should read called So Long, See You Tomorrow by William Maxwell. And it's about two boys, middle school, and one year they are best friends and they see each other at school next year and their friendship is just gone. And there's no reason for it. And it's so real. He absolutely nails that thing of like, for like two years, this was my best friend and I will probably never see them again, even though they still live in the town with me. It just happens. And it's a really painful novel to read, but it is so brilliant. I will definitely pick that up. Thank you. And I love it that you have your sister and your boyfriend having you back with this. Yeah. 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 They're really awesome. He was like, I don't think you should go. I think that wouldn't be good for you. He was like, I do think you need to tell her. Instead of just sending in an RSVP saying no, I was like, I appreciate that. Like, I do think I should. I don't think you need to call her. I think you can text her. Oh my God, I got your thing. That was so nice of you. I'm so bummed I won't be able to make it have the best wedding. You're going to look beautiful. Oh my God, literally write that word for word. That was perfect. Did you get that? I know, that's really great. I'm writing it. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Got it. Anna has it recorded. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. (laughs) I think the hardest part really is just the mourning of the friendship that was. Mm-hmm. It's a step forward toward taking care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, true. That's a great way to put it. You're growing up. Moving forward, yeah. And you're not going to be hurting her feelings, by the way. But it's a grown-up decision for you to take that step. Yeah. Violet, thank you so much. I hope that we confirm your gut. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is definitely helpful. And I will take all of your advice. Thank you so much. And honestly, I have related to so many of your episodes and this one, obviously, but just thank you for everything, guys. That means the world. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Violet. Bye, Violet. Bye, Violet. I just couldn't love you guys more. Uh, Thank you so very much. Anna, you're so adorable and smart and thoughtful and kind. And you're just so genuinely like sensitive to other people's issues. And gosh, what a beautiful soul you have. I just thought you were cute and adorable. I didn't realize you're so lovely and deep. It's so nice to meet you. Yeah. It's so nice to meet you too. Thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Yeah. 